we're talking about the doctrine of perseverance. And we started sort of like our series on the doctrine of eternal security. Now, if you guys remember some time back, I spoke a little bit about we're in that part of our statement of faith where people disagree with different doctrines and so forth. We talked about reformed theology and all that. So today, we're gonna to start talking about the idea of whether or not a Christian can fall away from the faith or whether or not a Christian can lose his salvation, quote unquote. And so last time we touched on it a little bit towards the end. And there's going to be, when you, when you come to this issue of whether or not a Christian can lose his salvation or not, there's going to be two main point of views, which is obviously the people who believe that you cannot and those who believe that you do. Today I'm going to cover the issue of eternal security. In other words, there are Christians, in fact, most mainline evangelical big preachers believe that a Christian, once you're saved, that you cannot fall away from the faith, that, that you can never be lost again. In fact, the way that this is defined is, and this is a quote by Charles Stanley, is eternal security is that work of God in which he guarantees the gift of salvation once received is possessed forever and cannot be lost. And so most of the mainline preachers, guys like Charles Stanley, Tony Evans, MacArthur, Chuck Swindoll, you know, the guys that you see on TV, most of them hold to this view that a Christian cannot fall away from the faith. On the other hand, there are other believers, uh, historically and in various different denominations, who believe that a Christian can and do fall away from the faith. And your church, the church that you guys are attending right now, uh, Pastor Bolden holds that a Christian cannot fall away from the faith, and I hold that you could, okay? And somehow, you know, when we get to heaven and God proves him wrong, um, <laughs> we'll find out. But for now, we agree to disagree and coexist and whatnot. It's not an essential issue. Nobody is going to hell for disagreeing. But since we're in this topic, we're going to cover it. And we're going to talk about it a little bit. All right. So, like I said, eternal security is the idea that once a Christian is saved, that person can never be lost again. Hence the phrase, once saved, always saved. Okay. So, as it is with all these different teachings and disagreements, you're going to have several verses and several scriptures that people go to to defend and prove their doctrine. Okay, so today uh, we're going to cover a few of these verses from the perspective of those who believe in eternal security. So we're going to begin in John chapter 10, verse 27. And the scripture says this, uh, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they will never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. I am the Father, are one. And so, if you guys remember back when we covered about Reformed theology, my sheep would be like the elect. That's how they interpret that. Well, the idea is here that those who are Christ, those who belong to Jesus, those who belong to God, implying those who are saved, receive eternal life in such a sense that they can never lose it. They will never perish. Once you receive eternal life, you can never ever perish. Furthermore, Jesus says that no one can snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all. No one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. I and the Father are one. So what Jesus is saying is the Father's hands and my hand is the same, okay? And once you're given eternal life, you can never perish again. Once you receive eternal life, eternal life stays with you and you can never perish. So Jesus' hand and the Father's hand are the same and nobody can snatch them out. Also, Jesus emphasizes by saying that my Father who has given them to me is greater than than all. So Jesus is emphasizing the power of the Father and the Father's hand to keep those who come to him, to those who receive eternal life from Jesus Christ, 
are kept by the Father in his hand, and nobody or no one can snatch them out. Okay? So you can see how this verse is used to teach that doctrine. John chapter 5, verse 24 says this, Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He will not come into judgment, but he has passed from death unto life. And so in these verses, you get the idea and the emphasis is given that once you receive this eternal life, once you have eternal life, then that is it. You cannot perish. You'll never go back into perdition. Once you have it, it's yours. So, and you will never go in onto judgment. John chapter 6, verse 37, all that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me, I will not, I will never cast them out. So the same emphasis in all of these verses is the same. Once they're in, they'll never be out again. Okay? So, now these are some of the more generic verses that are typically used. The word eternal is stressed, right? They receive eternal life. Eternal life is eternal life. So if you have eternal life, and at some point you don't have eternal life or you lose it, then it was never eternal to begin with because it stopped at some point, right? That's the way it's typically addressed. So once you receive eternal life, eternal life is eternal life. It goes on forever. So once you start it, you can never end it, okay? This is some of the ways in which you hear this taught. Now, all of these verses, like I said, they're in Scripture, okay? And next week we'll address them from the different points of view. But we're also given, in the Bible, all these great promises of security. Philippians chapter 1, verse 6 says this, And I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. Once God begins a work in the Christian's life, he's not going to end it. He's going to continue that work and bring it to completion. If God begins a work in your life, he's not going to abandon it. He's going to continue that work in your life all the way to the end. Okay? So there's a promise of security there. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 7 says this, So that you're not lacking in any gift, as you wait for the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ, who will sustain you to the end, guiltless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. He will sustain you to the end, guiltless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. May your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful. He will surely do it. All these verses show the security that a believer has when he is in Christ. He will complete the work. He's not going to abandon the work. He's going to be with you. He's going to present you guiltless, etc., etc., etc. All of these are simply uh, promises that were given in the scriptures about how God, if you're a believer, is going to have your back, so to speak, all the way until he brings you home. Okay? He's going to be there with you. He's not going to abandon you. All right? 2 Timothy chapter 4. The Lord will rescue me from every evil deed and bring me safely into his heavenly kingdom. To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Okay? So, all these verses, like I said, if you look at them, they're emphasizing security. They're emphasizing God's power to keep you. They're emphasizing the faithfulness of God towards those who believe to safely bring them home. Okay? So, we also have other verses. We're just going to go through all, this, all these verses before I start explaining. The Bible speaks about something called the seal of the Spirit. Meaning, when a person becomes saved, the Bible teaches that the Spirit of God comes and dwells within you. Okay? The Bible calls this the seal of the Spirit. In Ephesians chapter 1, verse 11. You guys know where Ephesians is at, right? Ephesians 1 verse 11 says this, In him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, so that we who were 
the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, you were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. So the Apostle Paul is saying that the Holy Spirit is God's seal and the guarantee of our inheritance. So think of it of like a deposit, maybe, or an earnest, you know, when you buy a house and you're going to get a loan, and you, you have to give uh, an earnest to say, basically, that's sort of like a guarantee that I'm going to pay this whole thing, right? I'm going to... I'm going to give you a guarantee that I'm going to pay. Here's my earnest, right? So the Holy Spirit is God's guarantee to you that he's going to make good on the rest of the promises, right? So when you get saved, God gives you his guarantee, which is the Holy Spirit, and says, here's my down payment. I'm going to make good on the rest. So you get a guarantee from God and a seal that you're going to get everything else. So obviously, the emphasis that this is going to be given is that God is not going to break that promise. right? God gives you an earnest, a seal, and a guarantee that he's going to bring you home. So he's not going to turn back on his word. He's going to be faithful. Okay. So the earnest of the Spirit and the, the seal of the Spirit carries that idea that this is God's pledge to you as a believer that he's going to make good in what he's promised to you. So if God says, I'm going to bring you home, I'm going to bring you to heaven, you're not going to go into damnation. He's going to make good on that promise. All right. So the Holy Spirit is God's seal, like an engagement ring, saying that this person is now in a relationship with this other person and also guarantee that you're going to get everything that follows. You see this also in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 21. And it is God who establishes us with you in Christ and has anointed us and who has also put his seal on us and given us his spirit in our hearts as a guarantee. Okay. And so the emphasis on this teaching is going to be that God guarantees that every person that gets saved is going to go to heaven no matter what, okay? And so there's also the issue of can you be separated from Christ? Can a person, once he is in Christ, be separated or be, you know, separated again from Christ? So the answer to this question is in Romans chapter 8, verse 31. And it goes like this. What shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? Who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies, who is to condemn. Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword as it is written, for your sake, we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. Now in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor death, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. So the answer can we separate it from Christ, is no. When you read these verses, they will say the list that Paul is giving, which is a very long list, tribulation, hunger, famine, etc. And then he completes it by saying, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. Okay, so the apostle gives us a list of things and then he wraps them all up saying it or anything else in creation. Nothing will be able to separate the believer from the love of God. So these are but a few of the verses that are used typically when dealing with the doctrine of eternal security. So if you ever get into if you ever hear a sermon about or if you, you know, YouTube now you got preachers who will have like Q&A's 
you know, can you lose your salvation? And I'll give you like a five minute answer. You're going to probably hear a variation of these verses that are brought forth to prove the teaching. Okay. Now, obviously, we're all Christians. So we all believe the Bible the same. We all believe that the Bible is true. So the difference is going to be in how we interpret and understand these verses. Okay. Now, last time I gave you like uh, the different views that people within eternal security hold to. Okay. And there are mainly two views. One is called the perseverance of the saints. You guys remember the, the thing that I did on the board. And this is the idea that a true believer cannot fall away from the faith, cannot be lost. But at the same time that that believer, if you're truly saved, then you will persevere in the faith, meaning you will live a holy, godly life. Okay. And you will not fall away completely onto sin. You may for a period of time, but you will return. But if you're truly saved, you will persevere. R.C. Sproul, who holds to this view, or used to because he passed away, says, True Christians can have radical and serious falls, but they can never totally and finally fall from grace. So these are the folks that sometimes you hear saying, if somebody falls away from the faith, they were never truly saved to begin with. That type of thing. Okay, so the idea is you cannot fall away, but if you do, then you were never saved because the true Christian will persevere living a godly life. Okay, so that's going to be like your Reformed folks, Presbyterian folks, and some other folks will hold to that view. The other view is, which is the more popular, that a true believer cannot be lost, cannot fall away from the faith, even if they fall into sin, or even if they stay in sin, your personal righteousness has nothing to do with your status with God. Okay? So you could fall away. You could fall into sin. You can go back to sin. But you can never truly, if you're truly a believer, that's not going to affect your salvation. Okay? Now, the way that this is taught is they teach something called positional standing and then your practical standing. Your position with Christ is unchangeable. Once you have faith, your sins are forgiven, past, present, and future. Obviously, if all of your future sins have been forgiven, they've already been forgiven. And your position as far as Christ or in Christ is unchangeable. That's it, you're saved. Your practical life may change. You may be holy, you may be unholy, you may live in sin, or not, but that's not going to affect your position in Christ, okay? The problem that some people find is that they, some people feel like this gives some folks license to sin. Because if your position in Christ is not changed, it's once, once I get my, my salvation going on, whatever I do afterwards is not going to affect my salvation. I still get to go to heaven. Let me give you some quotes here. Charles Stanley says, even if a believer for all practical purpose becomes an unbeliever, his salvation is not in jeopardy. A Christian who at no point in his entire life bore any fruit, yet his salvation is never jeopardized. So the idea is simply that no matter how you live as a, as a, as a person or as a Christian, your life may be affected. Right? Sin has consequences, you know, in your life. Sin may affect you and your family. Sin may affect your rewards in heaven, your fellowship with God, but it can never affect your salvation. Right? Your salvation is secure, is saved, and once you're saved, you're always saved no matter what. Now, I believe, though there are some good people who teach this, Charles Stanley, Chuck Swindle, Tony Evans, and so forth, I believe that that could be a dangerous teaching, obviously, because, as I said, if, if your salvation is so secure that no matter how you live, you're still good, then why should I do anything right, right? And so this is going to be your most popular understanding of once saved, always saved. Now, on the other hand, you have the other guys who teach that the true saint will persevere, will live a godly life. If he falls away, he will return in repentance. If he doesn't, then he was never saved to begin with. 
Now, these are going to be the folks who are always telling you, you know, uh, examine yourself, make your calling and election sure, that type of things, because their idea is if you're a true believer, then you will persevere. So make sure that you're persevering, so, you know, because you can never fall away. If you do, you were never safe to begin with. Now, I feel that has some practical issues, myself personally, my opinion, um, because if I fall away and get saved, how do I know that this one is the right one? If the other one kind of seemed like the right one, how is this one the right one now? But their emphasis, these, these guys will emphasize holiness, right living, sanctification, and things like that. I, I believe that in practice, this is proper. This is biblical, okay? In theory, I may disagree with it, but in practice, I believe that this view is biblical. Now, the view that I want to spend some time warning you about is the one that I just spoke to you about, which is obviously the most popular one, and is the one that when you see people in Christianity in America who are not living in accordance to their calling, understand that there is a doctrine behind that is backing them up. And that is this teaching that a Christian can be positionally in Christ, and that's going to be completely separate from their lives that they live. I think that's unbiblical. And last time we cover many verses, we've been going through many verses that encourage and exhort Christians to live a godly life. Now, most of those people would tell you, yes, you should live a godly life. It's almost optional. You should do it because your life will be better, because you would be honoring God. But that's separate from your salvation. I don't believe that's the case. Okay? I believe that the true Christian and the true believer, regardless of where you stand as far as whether a person can be lost or not, is going to live or should live and is obligated by God to live a godly life. Okay? So... The doctrine of eternal security, or the doctrine of once saved, you're always safe, however you want to call it, it's proper, right? I'm not going to say it's, not, it's, a, it's, a, it's a heresy. It's not a heresy. But depending on how it's taught, it could be dangerous. Equally, as I spoke last time, is the teaching, those of us who grew up in storefront, holiness, Pentecostal-type churches, where people are getting saved every Sunday. So every Sunday you get saved because every Tuesday you lose your salvation. Every Tuesday. I don't know why it's Tuesday, but it's every Tuesday. I guess Monday you just kind of, you're still on fire Monday from Sunday and Tuesday starts waning. Okay, that, that is also a dangerous teaching, okay? And sometimes when people in both camps attack each other, they're attacking the extreme bad part of each other's side. So I've been into arguments with folks when I when I when I got saved. I got saved when did I got? 2005. I worked at this particular store. I don't know if I can say any names. It's going into bankruptcy pretty soon. Uh, I didn't say anything. Um, so. Anyways, when I got saved, when I got saved, your, your, your boy Omar was a little bit different back then than now. So I used to go to work and I used to like play Christian music out loud, I hand out gospel tracts, tell people they're going to hell and stuff. Anyways, I'm going to get into all that. But there was a guy there who, he was like a, I don't know, like a supervisor or whatever. He was a Christian. And I didn't know he was a Christian. I found out he was a Christian and I was so excited. Because like I'm by myself at this job with these heathens, and I'm just fighting this battle, and just, just, you know what I'm saying? So I find out another Christian here, right? So, you know, I start talking to him, and I was so excited. And the reason I found out is because I used to bring my Bible to work, my Bible, which was like the size of that laptop. Um, I had a huge Bible. So I'm walking by the little desks because it was like a warehouse. And there's another Bible. And I was like, another Bible. Somebody has a Bible. Who has a Bible? Somebody else has a Bible. So I found out that this guy was a Christian. Anyways, um, 
I started talking to him, and he was, a, he was a nice guy. He was an older guy. He, hopefully, he's still alive. He was old, okay. And um, he was a Baptist, okay. So, and I didn't know what a Baptist was. I didn't know what a, you know, he asked me, what church do you go to? And I was like, I just, yeah, I, I'm a Christian. So, what, but he's like, what church? It's like, it's a, it's a church Christian. It's a Christian church. I don't know. Where you go and Jesus is at. So he's like, oh, yeah, yeah, but like what type, what kind, you know? He's inquiring, you know, he's, he's doing his thing, you know, he's a Baptist. So, so I'm like, um, yeah, I just, you know, it's a church. It's like a Christian normal church. It's not like a Catholic church. And then he asked me for the name, and it was a Spanish church, so I'm translating in my brain. So it's like, oh, yeah, God's assembly. And uh, he's like, assemblies of God? Yes, whatever, that thing. So... He, you know, I guess he knew what the Assemblies of God was, what they teach and all that. So he started like, so, so what do you guys like believe? And I'm like, Jesus, uh, Jesus. <laughs> so anyways, days go by and he starts inquiring. He starts asking little questions, uh, poking around. So he's like, so he, he focused on two things, okay, tongues and Losing your salvation. So he's like, so uh, you spoke in tongues yet or something like that? I'm like, oh, no, I don't, you know, no. And I'm like all depressed about it and stuff. So and then he's like, uh, you still saved? And I'm like, oh, yeah, I'm still saved. Oh, OK. You didn't lose it or anything. And I'm like, what? No, why would I? And he's like, oh, OK. No, I'm just saying, you know, you, you guys believe you like you could lose it and stuff, right? I'm like. I guess. I don't know anything. I'm just like one year old, basically, on this thing. So he was hearkening about that, okay? He's hearkening about that stuff. He's poking around. He's doing his little jokes, you know, the tip, typical stuff. And he's like, just don't sneeze too hard, you know? You might lose your salvation. And, um, and so, which is, a, uh, by the way, that's a great thing to do with a newborn Christian. You just ridicule them and stuff. Uh, I'm just kidding. He was a nice man, and he was the, type, the person who kind of drove me into investigating this stuff. I didn't know anything about that there were different Christians. I'm thinking the Catholic Church, which is the devil, and then boom, Jesus. That's all I knew, okay? So, anyways, the, the emphasis, if you can see, if you've ever been into these conversations, I don't know if anybody's been into these conversations, you're always going to have people who are going to look at the worst of the opposite side, right? And they're going to try to hit that, okay? So on my side of the fence, you're going to have the folks that's like, oh, you just, I, you just smoke and drink and do all you want and still go to heaven, huh? Right? You just don't even need to be holy and stuff like that. Both of those views are extremes of each other, okay? Not everybody who holds to eternal security believes it that way, and not everybody who holds to conditional security, whatever you want to call it, believes that you lose your salvation every time you sneeze, okay? And so in representing both views, we have to try to be the most fair as we can possibly be, all right? And um, it was a fun time to Sears, by the way. It was some good time. The, the guy, I know, they're going bankrupt. Um, the guy, <laughs> the, the guy actually, like I said, he, he, was, he was a good guy. He was just, you know, Baptist. And he um, ended up giving me a Bible, which I still have, which is a chronological Bible, which you read the Bible in the chronological order, which is really, really nice. I still have it. He gave it to me or he lent it to me? I don't know. I have it. Um, <laughs> So I haven't lost that. See? Secure. Anyway. Oh. See, Chaz, Chaz. Anyways. All right. Stop this. Let's get serious. All right. Um, and so here's what I got to say. This is, this is my conclusion. We have all these verses that promise us all these great things. We have all these verses that talk about how the Christian is secure. We have all these verses that are, tells us that we have a guarantee in heaven, etc. Um, all of which are biblical verses, but the problem and the issue w with this teaching comes when we start looking at other verses in the Bible. For example, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 26, 
This is where we start running into some problems. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 26 says this. For if we go on sinning deliberately after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a fearful expectation of judgment and a fury of fire that will consume the adversaries. Anyone who has set aside the law of Moses dies without mercy on the evidence of two or three witnesses. How much more punishment do you think will be deserved by the one who has trampled underfoot the Son of God and has profaned the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified and has outraged the spirit of grace? For we know him who said, Vengeance is mine, I will repay. And again, the Lord will help his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of a living God. So here we have a verse in Hebrews chapter 10 addressing believers, warning them that if you go on sinning willfully, deliberately, returning back to a life of sin after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a fearful expectation of judgment and the fury of fire that will consume the adversaries or the enemies of God. And so here's a warning from Scripture for believers that if they return into a life of sin, they are not to expect anything but judgment and fire that will consume the adversaries. So. If all of the verses that we read before are true, and they are because they're in the Bible, and if this verse here is true, and it is because it's in the Bible, so the problem becomes how do you reconcile these two ideas? The Christian has a guarantee from God, that the Christian is kept by God, that the Christian is going to be... Um, sustained by the power of God, that nobody can snatch him out of God's hand, that uh, nothing can separate you from the love of God. Yet at the same time, we have a verse here, and there are many other verses. We don't have time to cover them today. We will next week. Where warnings are given to believers not to fall away, and if they do, then they can expect judgment. Not to mention there are verses in the Bible that say, you, you know, are kept and saved, etc., if you continue on to believe. Implying that if you don't, then you don't get the, what was promised. And so the difficulty is in reconciling all these verses that says we are saved by grace through faith, not of works, and then all these other warnings in Scripture that says, you need to stay in the faith. If you go back, then you can, you, all you're expecting, he says here, is a judgment and a fury of fire that will consume the adversaries. Okay? So the difficulty lies in reconciling those two things. All right? And so, how do you reconcile them together? We'll get into that next week because I don't have time right now. But the important thing is for us to understand that... When we look at different doctrines, when we look at how Christians disagree over certain issues, you have to be, we have to be intelligent enough and smart enough to know where the limits are and what could be a different view that's still within the range of Christian and biblical, okay? That's where the difficulty is and you know, if you've been around for some time, if you interacted with certain people, with certain traditions, you will find some of the ridiculing that I've encountered, and probably some of you have. But at the same time, we have to be honest enough to deal with the text as it is, and as it is presented to us. So, next week, we'll get a little bit into the opposite view. Warning, it is the view that I hold to next week, so... I'm going to try to be as unbiased as I can. Like I said, as, as we deal with this issue, it's important for us to understand that Christians, you know, there's, I think it was Ray, when we got into the issue of Reformed theology, that he was like, you know, like the idea of two Christians disagreeing and still be Christian was like something, there's like a concept that he told me. He's like, I don't, didn't even think about that before, right? Because in some circles, this is, this is it, and if you go here, 
see you. We have to learn how to live with each other, okay, within a certain parameter. We have to learn how to live with each other within a certain parameter because Christ is our Lord and Savior. And within certain parameters, we will disagree because we're human, okay? But as long as we keep it within that parameter, as long as you don't jump out into Jehovah's Witness land or something, you can still be my brother in Christ, and we can still fellowship and all that stuff, all right? So... Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your scriptures, Lord. We thank you that even though we might as believers and as human beings have a finite mind and disagree that you still uh, love your people, that your spirit is still at work in our lives, Lord. And we know for sure that for those who believe in you, that we have great promises ahead of us, Lord. We thank you for your word. We thank you for your scriptures, Lord. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.